The new Golf GTI doesn't have a beard, but it is lighter, faster and more efficient than the car it replaces. Now, many enthusiasts have always thought that this car is just too boring to wear the GTI badge, but I've always disagreed with that. Does this Mark VII version change anything? The Golf GTI is quite a simple car, but it's one with a complicated history and a complicated set of responsibilities. On the one hand, it's the car that should be everything to all people. It's the classless performance car that does everything all the time for all people. But on the other hand, it's a car that was once an enthusiast object, a car that people like me lusted after. And then it became a car that people like me slightly laughed at. And then more recently, again, it became a car that we respected. So within that, there's the full range of emotions. So when I come to test a car like a Golf GTI, it's quite difficult, really. Who am I speaking to? Am I speaking to the full hardcore enthusiast? I'm not sure that person buys a Golf GTI. Am I speaking to the casual driver, the person who doesn't really care? Well, they wouldn't be watching one of my videos. I don't really know. Actually, do you know what? I think a lot of people that know a lot about cars quietly respect the Golf GTI. And if they were given the chance to own one car year round, I think they'd look long and hard at one of these. So, let's have a look at the Golf GTI. First of all, some numbers. This car has 220 horsepower because it's the base GTI. It doesn't have the performance pack, which costs another about a thousand pounds and gives you another 10 horsepower. So we have 220, we have 258 foot-pounds of torque, a maximum speed claimed at 152 miles an hour, and 0 to 60 in 6.5 seconds. All seems entirely reasonable and acceptable to me. Basic setup of the Golf, well, it's a Golf body, independent suspension all the way around, electric power steering, and a turbocharged four-cylinder engine. It's becoming a kind of normal recipe, isn't it? But Volkswagen reckons they've added some abnormal stuff to this. They've brought in people from other projects, let's say, within the Volkswagen Group. A man who was involved with the GT3 RS, 3.8-litre version, the Gen 2 one that we all loved, Karsten Shebstadt, he has worked on this car. And to me, initially, it feels like a clever car on the road. It feels nice and supple. They haven't gone down the crazy, hardcore, over-damped, over-sprung route. And that has to be a great start. Now, even though we have an open differential, you can turn off the traction control in this, and it scrabbles its way out of second gear turns pretty well. I wouldn't really miss the diff on the road. It's got a really nice front end. It's accurate. Steering, as ever, in the electric way, doesn't have any great sense of connection to it but they're getting good at this stuff, you know. I think we're going to be at a point fairly soon where they can start to replicate the feel of hydraulic steering. I think the actual weighting is good, even though it does shunt around a bit according to speed. It's an enjoyable car to drive fast, but it's not a kind of car that you decide to grow horns and drive too hard. However, if you do, its competence comes through and through and through. This has been developed to the nth degree, this car. You can just tell they've spent time getting all the performance from it that they possibly can. There are three driving modes in this new GTI. Normally this stuff doesn't interest me because I think you should just have a suspension set up and deal with it. But this car's quite interesting. We start out in comfort and I like cars in comfort, even cars with badges like GTI, because they tend to work better on the road. So we've got this quite long travel feel, it's supple, feels really, really nicely damped over these roads, and comfortable, it's not sort of irritating me, but it doesn't feel too sloppy and, uh, and lazy, it wants to change direction. It's, it's an agile car like this, but it's rolling enough to give me an idea of what's going on. If I go to normal, I don't have a profoundly different car. In fact, I still seem to retain 90% of that comfort, maybe more, and I just lose a bit of roll. The steering remains sharp. It's a variable ratio rack, so I've got 2.1 turns. Much more assistance at low speed than I have at high speed. So in normal, I think it's rather nicely balanced. In fact, I might leave it in normal. This is the interesting one for me, though. If I go into sport, Normally, when I press the sport button in car, it's a button that says, I'll tell you what, let's totally f the dynamics of the car and make it horrible to drive. 
unless you're on a really flat racing track, but no one drives a Golf GTO on a really flat racing track, do they? But I'm now in sport mode and this car has not been shafted. I've got flatter cornering, but I've retained a sort of supple edge to the suspension. It feels like that initial spring rate, that initial amount of spring isn't too harsh, almost like there's a variable rate spring on the car. And so I'm cushioned and it's not unpleasant. Yes, it's firmer. Yes, I've got more control, but it hasn't wrecked it for the road. I think that's a very important distinction because all too often sport mode wrecks things. And in the Golf GTI on the road, it doesn't. The motor itself, well, you can look at it two ways. It's either a bit bland and not that much fun, or it's ruthlessly efficient and impressively smooth. Four cylinders, to me, used to mean quite harsh, but this is smooth as you like. And as for the turbocharging and the throttle response, I cannot fault it. Fourth gear, 80 clicks. You put your foot down and it just goes. I mean, really goes. And it gives you the impression of far more performance than a car with a claim 0-62 time of six and a half seconds. Manual gearbox, gear shift is lovely. Makes me ask a few more questions of Renault, this does. If Volkswagen can make a manual gearbox for the Golf GTI, a car which I think is more often not specified with a DSG gearbox, then why can't they do a manual gearbox for their Clio RS? This is a lovely shift. Short shift, but not too short. Very, very accurate. Clutch pedal's nice. In fact, the relationship between the three pedals is quite good. And when you're pushing on, the heel and toe is quite natural as well. Haven't driven the DSG yet, but we might get a skid in one of those tomorrow, but we know all about their gearbox and just how efficient it is. This five-door car with a manual gearbox is a very, very nicely balanced package, but it has got a couple of problems. The first problem is its price, and the second problem is related to that. It's not a cheap car. If you were to buy this car and specify it with five doors, a DSG gearbox, and the performance pack, you'd end up with a car that cost over £28,000 and that drags it right into BMW M135i territory. Now I know people think I'm boring about that car. The machine has 300 horsepower, probably weighs a little bit less, and its performance is on a completely different level to the Golf GTI. So I'm worried that the Golf GTI's marketplace has been taken away from it. I can't really give you any answer to that until I drive the two of them back to back. But it's interesting to note, isn't it, that a near £30,000 Golf GTI is upon us, and yet BMW has a turbocharged six-cylinder rival to that car in the market already. Basic layout of the car. Well, this is... What are those? Bald sheep. They look like Gollum. Do you see those? Scared me. Start again. It's Gollum! <laughs> yeah. I look wrong, I'm like Middle Earth.